We're about to get started. Thank you for joining us as we host tonight's program featuring Professor Xiao Zhen Hu, Research Fellow at the Institute of Chinese Literature and Philosophy at the Academia Sinica in Taiwan. My name is Hans Saucy, and I'm University Professor in the Departments of Comparative Literature and East Asian Languages and Civilizations, as well as the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. The Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Chicago is pleased to be cooperating once again with the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Chicago, otherwise known by its acronym TECO, T-E-C-O, to present lectures to showcase important scholarship about and from Taiwan. We are grateful to co-sponsor this event with support from the Taiwan Ministry of Culture and TECO through their dedicated Spotlight Taiwan program. I'd like to welcome everyone this evening, particularly our special guests in attendance tonight from the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Chicago, including Daniel Hong, who is the director of TICO, and John Y. Lin, director of the Education Division. For more information on the University of Chicago's Center for East Asian Studies, please visit the CEAS website and subscribe to receive weekly outreach emails. Those links will be provided in the chat box. And for more information pertaining to our co-sponsor, the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Chicago, please visit the link that will also be provided in the chat box. The presentation tonight will be followed by a question and answer session. To ask a question to be addressed during this part of the program, please be sure to type in your questions into the Q&A box. They'll then be passed on to me and our speaker. So let me introduce then, uh, unfortunately, briefly, our speaker, Hu Xiaozhen, Xiaochen Hu. She is a research fellow at the Academia Seneca, as you heard. She has uh, an intimidating number of books, which have won an intimidating number of prizes. And in each case, she's chosen a topic that was not obvious or easy, uh, certainly not easy to search or easy to make up one's mind about. Uh, I'll, I'll read some of the titles of her books going back as far as 2003, and you'll get a sense of the range of her scholarship. Uh, there's one called Talented Women Going Without Sleep, The Rise of Women's Narrative Literature in Modern China. I'm improvising English equivalents of the titles. Please forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> There's also On the Traditionalist Wing of Women Writers in Shanghai in Late Qing and Early Republic, which is a, a very unusual uh, and sort of non-canonical formation of women writers at that particular moment of cultural change. Uh, another book, Catastrophe, Literary Art in the Late Ming and Late Qing Eras. Uh, brings two periods of immense cultural and social change together for a comparison. Would have been enough just to write about one of those periods, but to write about two of them and to coordinate the observations, that's really something. And her most recent book, uh, which is related to the subject of tonight's talk, is Ming Qing Zhong de Xinan Xu Shi. In uh, the Southwest in Inching Literary Imagination, published by Taida Chu Ban Sha. I just happen to have a copy here, and I can't pre I can't prevent myself from boasting about it because it is such uh, a wonderful work of scholarship. Very well presented, by the way, by the press. So congratulations to you, Xiao Zhen, on getting them to do such a great job. So <laughs> tonight's talk is. Uh, uh, is about women rulers in South China. It's, uh, it's a topic where you have uh, a certain clash of cultures and a certain use of language to, uh, to sometimes paper over and sometimes confront cultural difference. I know it's good and they're very to give our homage in the form of questions. So, I also want to thank um, 
expectations um, for inviting me. And of course, I want to thank you, the Taiwan Ministry of Culture and Tico, so very few <laughs> for um, sponsoring this event. Okay, now I'm going to share. Oops. Okay. Uh, can everyone see the screen? Yes? Okay. Now, um, in this talk, I will discuss how female rulers um, of the South are represented in historical and literary text. What I mean by the South refers to Yunnan, Guizhou, Sichuan, Guangxi, Guangdong, and probably Fujian. I certainly understand that this is a very vast region and uh, we must recognize the natural and cultural differences within it. However, in contrast to the ideas of the north, uh, the central plains, um, or the south of the Yangtze River area, and so on, the south seems to share some commonality precisely because of its marginal status in Chinese history. The term female ruler or nu zhu in Chinese um, is generally applied to the mothers, wives, and daughters of male rulers of Chinese dynasties who participated in or um, had impact on political affairs. I would propose that if we consider the very frequent circumstances of separatist rule, uh, north-south division, and modification policy, then it is necessary to take women in power outside the imperial court as female rulers. The most apparent examples are the Tu Si chieftains. In the Ming Dynasty, the Tu Si were in effect regimes that enjoyed partial autonomy in relation to the bureaucratic government. Female chieftains emerged from the soils of this Tu Si hereditary system, which allowed women to mount chieftainship. It resembled the um, hereditary symbol, of, I'm sorry, the hereditary system of royal houses. The chieftains were said to be small countries within the empire, Guo Zhong Zhi Guo. I didn't invention this term, I quote it from um, a meeting author's comment. Female rulers were exceptional cases in Chinese dynasties, whereas in the Tu Si re regions, women systematically inherited the posts of chieftains. What complicates the problem is that, from the point of view of the central administration, Tu Si chieftains could easily rise in revolt, and their female rulers, Nu Zhu, were equivalent to Nu Qiu, with the character Qiu carrying the double meaning of leader and bandit. So with this pun in mind, I will begin my discussion. Um, let's first visit the South in the 6th century and, before, and acquaint ourselves um, with some powerful women. In a collection of woodblock paintings of historical figures uh, entitled Nanling Wu Shuang Pu, album of the Unparalleled, dated 1694, there is a painting of Lady Xian of Qiao Guo, Qiao Guo Furen, Xian Shi. The woman in armor carries a spear and a sword, tilting her head upward and looking straight ahead. The painter tried to portray her as a poised military leader with authority, as well as beauty. In the epigraph, the painter says, the tribes of the hundred years rested in peace thanks to the lady who ruled for 70 years. The central plains underwent dynastic change three times, but here, just the woman stayed in charge. Just a woman, Chi Chi Yi Fu, 
sound condescending, but it's actually a compliment pointing to the successful governing ruling of the female ruler. So, who exactly was Lady Xian? In the sixth century, during the North-South division. The Thousand Dynasties were in the transition from the Liang and Chen dynasties to the unified Sui dynasty. During this transition, the Gaoliang region, which was in today's Guangdong and inhabited by many non-Han peoples, stayed under the control of Lady Xian. She came from a family that had led the Lingnan region, uh, the 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 um, south of the Five uh, Ridges region for generations, and she demonstrated leadership since childhood, according to uh, historical sources. When the Qin Dynasty collapsed, the Lingnan region did not have any allegiance, so people from the neighboring places decided to support Lady Xian as their leader. Later, she decided to pledge allegiance to the rising Sui dynasty and helped the Sui pacify several uprisings. Historical records often show Lady Xian on the inspection tour. As a local ruler, she represented the imperial court, but with all her political power, she also posed as a threat to the central government. It is said that in her old age, she would display the treasures, gifts given by the three different dynasties, and told her children that I have served, uh, I have served the three dynasties with one same good heart, Hao Xin. I managed to keep all these treasures. It's the reward of my piety and loyalty. I hope you all keep this in mind. Her speech. Was to convey the idea of allegiance to the central regime instead of to a particular royal house. This was the way to preserve the place she ruled. Strategy, not morality, lied behind Lady Xian's leadership. Historians found that the political implication of Lady Xian actually underwent transformations over time. In the Tang Dynasty, she was a symbol of conciliatory policy toward the periphery. In the Song, she symbolized the medium between the central government and the local society. Since the mid Ming, however, with the uprisings of the Yao ethnic people in the Guangxi and Guangdong areas, the grand narrative of the dynasty switched to. Um, the civilizing enterprise of Chinese culture. Therefore, Lady Xian also became the model of loyalty and assimilation. So, since the mid Ming, how was Lady Xian depicted as a non-Han woman from the periphery? Xie Zhaozhe, a late Ming writer, made a comment on Lady Xian in his miscellaneous notes Wu Zha Zu. It says, Lady Xian was a barbarian woman, but she was able to lead the army, take care of the Hundred Yue regions, and secure the Li and Liao ethnic groups. She was blessed with an extraordinary destiny, and enjoyed the sacrificial offerings over a thousand years. Her talent, wisdom, and achievements were beyond. What General Ma Yuan and General Wei Gao could have aspired to, compared to her, the Ladies' Army of the Pingyang Princess and Madame Han's defense of Xiangyang City had accomplished much less. As for Zheng Ce and Zhao Yu, a、uh, woman Zhao, they were not worth mentioning. Xie compared the Lady Xian to heroes and heroines in history and put her. On the highest level, Ma Yuan of the Han Dynasty pacified Jiao Zhi. We know that is Yunnan, uh, Vietnam, and Wei Gao of the Tang Dynasty ruled the Shu region and had a war with、um, Nan Zhao, that is、uh, Yunnan and Tibet. Princess Pingyang and Madame Han were both heroines who led troops in defense of their cities. However, I think. 
Zheng Ce and Wu Men Zhao, the two women who Xie said were not worth mentioning, are in fact the target of comparison, because they, like Lady Xie, were also female rulers of the South. Who are Zheng Ce and Wu Men Zhao? I have to admit that before this research, I knew nothing about them. They were legendary figures who won completely different reputations in Chinese and Vietnamese、uh, histories. General Ma Yuan went to the Jiu Zhen Jun area in 41 CE to pacify the rebellion led by Zheng Ce, Chung Chung Trac. I'm trying to speak in Vietnamese, failed of course, and <laughs> her sister Zheng Er Chun Ni. Um, in Chinese history, it is called the Rebellion of the Two Zheng, Er Zheng Zhi Luan. In official history, such as the Hou Han Shu, the Zheng sisters are rebels, but without any personalities. Anecdotes are, on the other hand, are different. Many gazetteers of Guangxi allude to this passage, which says. In the region of the Five Ridges, the women were able to ride animals and shoot strong arrows. They wore patterned headbands when they sat in military camps with thousands of people bending their knees to them, not daring to look up. There have been countless examples of Zheng Ce and Zhao,、um, Zheng Ce and Zheng Er. The description. Gives us a mental picture of gallant women with power and leadership, and the Zheng sisters are only two examples. In Vietnamese history, on the other hand, the two sisters are honored as the founding mothers of the country. In Da Yue Shi Ji, Chun Trac Zheng Yu Wang is a female ruler, Chun Zheng Yu Wang. And、uh, in Da Yue Shi Ji, the record says, "Chun, the Wang, on the throne for three years. The Wang was very valiant. She chased away Su Ding, the the bad Chinese governor, founded our country, and proclaimed herself the Wang. Being a female ruler, however, she was unable to sustain." According to Da Yue Shi Ji's comment, Zheng Ce was the Wang for only three years. But her accomplishment far surpassed the Vietnamese men afterwards, who submitted to Chinese rule for more than a thousand years. On the screen,、um, you can see how the two sisters were、uh, portrayed in a、uh, Vietnamese folk woodblock painting called、uh, Dong Hu Hua.、Um, there are Chinese characters um, 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 on the on the painting.、Um, Some of them are not exactly correct. For example, the name of the the bad、uh, Chinese governor Su Ding. I think it's more like what I did when I was a child. I <laughs> kind of switched the order. <laughs> All right, but、um, we we get the picture. Now, woman Zhao.、Um, this is really difficult to pronounce in 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 Vietnamese. It's something like Chu Ao.、Uh, let、um, a rebellion in the Jiu Zheng Jun area. In the third century, against the rule of Dongwu, she also had since become a national heroine of Vietnam. When Xie Zhaozhe compared Lady Xian to Zheng Ce and Wu Men Zhao, he was pointing out the fact that Lady Xian actually had the power to found a country and proclaim herself the Wang, right? He recognized the political choice of Lady Xian for not doing that, from the、um, Sinocentric point of view of a Ming literatus, of course. Wu Men Zhao had a more distinctive image. In Da Yue Shi Ji, according to a Chinese source,、um, Wu Men Zhao's body features are like superhuman, to say the least. It goes like this. It says, "Later there was Woman Zhao of Jiu Zhen Jun. Her breasts were three chi long, and she swung them to her back. 
she often rode on the elephant to battle with enemies. When she gathered crowds to plunder Chinese counties. This passage contains three characteristics of woman Zhao: her body feature, her breasts are very large, her attire she、uh, wears clogs, and her movement she goes to battle on an elephant's back. This has become the fixed image of woman Zhao, as you can see on the screen. Um, 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 this is also a Donghu Hua woodblock painting. Woman Zhao is portrayed as a heroine with extremely large breast.、Um, she's also riding on an elephant. In the early Qing, Qu Da Jun compiled an unofficial local gazetteer of Guangdong called Guangdong Xinyu,、um, New Stories of Guangdong. In the book, there is.、Um, A section about the five female lit-、uh, military leaders of Guangdong, Wu Nijiang. But before introducing the five women, Qu Da Jun mentioned Zheng Ce, Zheng Er, and、uh, Woman Zhao. When commenting on Zheng Ce, he said, "In the ancient time, for a woman to proclaim herself a Wang, whether in China or in foreign lands, there was no other case." How extraordinary! Interestingly, among the five Chinese women military leaders, there were two Xians. The first was a Madang Xian who pledged allegiance to Zhao Tuo, who founded the Nan Yue Guo、uh, Kingdom in、uh, 240 BCE. The second was Lady Xian, whom we just discussed, and this is how Qu Da Jun described Madang Xian, the first. Ah,、uh, Xian, he said. Madang Xian near Gaozhou, she was seven chi tall and had the strength of three people put together. Her breasts were more than two chi long. When she was out on a tour in summer, she often rested her breast on her shoulders. What a familiar spectacle! However, Qu Da Jun was not the first person to take note of Madame Xian's physical appearance. The earliest record could be a book called Ling Biao Lu Yi, Records of the、um, Extraordinary Beyond the Five Ridges, from the Tang Dynasty. It is most extraordinary because, according to this book, Madame Xian's breasts were more than seven chi long. No matter the breasts were three or two or seven chi long, and no matter they were swung to the back or put on the shoulders, the silhouettes of Woman Zhao and Madang Xian converged in the textual networks of Chinese and Vietnamese sources. Next, we turn to how Lady Xian、um, was treated in a Xia Ju play. Uh, titled Lin Chun Ge Facing Spring Pavilion by the late Ming early Qing writer Wu Weiye. To my knowledge,、uh, Lin Chun Ge is the earliest play featuring Lady Xian. It is believed that Wu Weiye used the、um, the collapse of the Qin Dynasty to、uh, reflect his mourning for the Southern Ming. In the play, Lady Xian represents. The power in the periphery that supports the Qin court.、Um, let's look at、um, the first scene of the play. When Lady Xian appears, she is dressed in military attire with a brocade umbrella above her head, representing her authority. In her monologue, she parallels herself with heroes and heroines of the past, including General Ma Yuan, who.、Um, Uh, we remember pacified the rebellion of the Zheng sisters. She also says that she has Yan Zhi to hold the reins and Zheng Er to wield the riding whip. Yan Zhi Peng Pei, Zheng Er Qing Bian, which is to say that she has queens from both the north and south to serve at her side. Perhaps more importantly. By portraying Lady Xian on her inspection tour to the border, the author 
uh, sort of drew a map of South China within and beyond the border. How so? Lady Xian tells the audience that feudatory princes from neighboring uh, regions and rulers from foreign countries will all gather to hear her command. So after the governors from south and north of the five ridges visit her, she orders to see the envoys from Myanmar, Funan, and Zhenla. She sends, uh, I'm going to read in Chinese, it's too difficult for me to translate. 你, 今夜文书自样先, 无也波旋, 与偏连, 赤之沙嘴脸, 波斯眼, 书花布, 江头禅, 五色线, 把环川, Okay, this song um, mentions um, diplomatic writings, dancing, um, oral languages, facial features, clothing, and food, all pointing to the foreignness or otherness one feels when having contacts with foreigners. And after this diplomatic exchange, she again puts herself in the domestic and yet foreign networks and receives chieftains from Luo Luo, Mu Gua, and Ge La. And we know these are names of the ethnic groups in the Southwest. Lady Xian reprimands the chieftains for their unstable support for the imperial court and goes on to propose the best way to solve their um, disputes. So she says, Again in Chinese, 你那边书写银卷, 安这边赏写锦段, Representing the um, imperial court, Lady Xian asks the chieftains to pay tributes regularly, and the court will reward them accordingly. We must note that from the start, the author is evasive about the fact that Lady Xian herself was a Nanghan woman. In fact, Lady Xian even makes this following comment. What I must do is to make the benevolent intentions of the court widely known and encourage military prefectures from all directions. Never let them think that when a woman is in charge of defending the border, the Yue people can take the hand in contempt. So clearly, Lady Xian has made her identity choice in this play. Wu Weiye had a point to make when he touched upon the question of relations between the imperial court and the chieftains of the South. Behind the character Lady Xian is the shadow of Qin Liang Yu, the most famous heroine of the late Ming. Qin Liang Yu was a female chieftain from the Sichuan who helped the Ming. In addition to pacifying the roving rebels, uh, she won quite a few wars against other chieftains. She was the synonym of loyalty and devotion. Wu Wei Ye saw the comparab uh, comparability between Qin Liang Yu and Lady Xian. That is, both were female rulers from the south. In doing so, however, Wu Weiye had to overlook the political choice that Lady Xian made to protect and preserve the place and peoples she uh, ruled. Um, next, I would like to use two examples to demonstrate how the image of the female ruler of the south um, uh, uh, oscillates between the Zheng sisters and uh, Lady Xian uh, and Qin Liang Yu compound. I, I would call them a compound. In 1301, Emperor Chengzong of the Yuan Dynasty dispatched troops to conquer a country called Country of 800 Wives, Ba Bai Xi Fu Guo, which was, um, we guess, uh, near present day Thailand and Myanmar. When the commander Liu Shen's troops passed through the province of Guizhou, the local chieftains started an uprising because they refused to provide provisions. A female chieftain called She Jie was one of the rebel leaders. 
Eventually, the emperor decided to、uh, withdraw the troops, but She Jie was also arrested and executed in 1303. In official histories and local gazetteers, She Jie was、um, a, 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 a ferocious rebellion.、Um, but in contemporary China, of course,、um, she is、um, she she has she has a different face. She is now honored as a heroine who led the Yi people to resist oppression. In contrast to the fate of She Jie, a female chieftain from the Xian area, fifty years later, had a different story. I actually talk about this in my book. According to a piece written by the Ming scholar Tian Ruchang, in the、um, early Ming, there was a female chieftain called She Xiang. At that time,、um, Guizhou governor planned to、um, cancel the system of chieftains and exert、uh, direct rule. So he arrested She Xiang and stripped her and beat her. Instead of rising in revolt, however, she fled to Nanjing to see the Emperor Ming Taizu and tried to negotiate. The Emperor agreed to kill the governor to avenge her, and in exchange, she promised to pay annual tribute and open a mountain pass from Guizhou to Yunnan, which would be very convenient for the Ming. In the end, She Xiang was bestowed、um, the title of、uh, a lady. She Jie and She Xiang they followed、uh, two strategies represented by the Zheng sisters and Lady Xian Qingliangyu compound, respectively, to interact with the imperial court. One was defiance and conflict, like the Zheng sisters, Woman Zhao. And She Jie, Chinese writers looked at them in contempt, in surprise, and in awe, with the image in mind of a woman in battle sitting on an elephant, swinging her breast to her back. But there was the other track. The other strategy was to pledge allegiance and negotiate. Chinese scholars tended to praise their loyalty and often endow them with exotic. Beauty and allure, from Lady Xian to She Xiang, from She Xiang to Qin Liangyu, a legacy of the ideal female chieftain was made out of them. Like in this poem dedicated to She Xiang by a Qin official when he served in Guizhou. After narrating the life of She Xiang, the poet says, "Qiao guo qian you feng fu ren, shi zhu hou you qin jiang jun." Uh, please note that Feng Furen、um, is actually Xian Furen because Xian Furen、uh, married a person named Feng Bao, so Xian Furen is Feng Furen. But of course, by putting them、um, in the category of ideal female chieftains, the poet had to conceal the compromises made by both the emperor and the chieftain, and defined She Xiang as a chaste and loyal subject. Of the imperial dynasty, who received abundant rewards. After all, the ideal female chieftains are chaste, they are loyal, they are virtuous, they are beautiful, and they are useful in serving the best interest of the court. As nice as the heritage of loyal female chieftains、um, sounds like, reality was. Um, full of noises. There was a different track, as we said.、Um, it's full of、um, violence, conflict, resistance, and destruction.、Um, that some female chieftains、um, they just chose to to take this track. The Zheng sisters, Woman Zhao and She Jie, were only specimens, as we can tell from how many strife and revolts、uh, the female chieftains started. Or got involved in. Female chieftains, because of their gender, were often metaphorically associated with the power of Yin. For example,、um, late Ming writer Chen Jiru once made this comment: 
China is in charge of the Yang, while the ED, the non Han, uh, the, the non Chinese, is in charge of the Ying. This explains why native chieftains and other barbarians in the periphery are under women's command. Chen Jiru essentialized the Chinese and the non Chinese as Yang and Ying and used the uh, dichotomy to define female ruling as the outer expression of the inner Ying. In the early Qing play Zhi Kan Ji, the author also described the last year of the Ming as a world of um, a, a world dominated by the pure in Chun Ying Zhi Shi Jie, because many female chieftains rose to power and caused turmoil in the late Ming. Um, why did the female chieftains arouse such fear of the dark power? Except for traditional Confucian norms that um, exclude women's power, perhaps the imagination was also triggered by um, their current events. Take Wanli Wu Gonglu, record of military achievements of the Wanli uh, reign as an example. It is a book about the pacification of uprisings and revolts of different regions, social groups, and ethnic people during the reign of Emperor Wanli of the Ming Dynasty. This book is comprised of Lie Zhuan biographies of historical figures, which is, uh, you know, the standardized form uh, format of uh, Chinese history writing. But interestingly and provocatively enough, the biographies center around the rebels and the bandits instead of those who actually went to pacify them. I guess we could call this a book of anti-heroes. Anyway, in this book, um, there is a, a, a chapter, a biography of two female chieftains, She Shitong and She Shishu, who were the wife and concubine of a, ch um, a, a chieftain called, um, uh, of Yongning, uh, Xuan Fufu. The story tells how they struggled with each other after their husband died for 25 years just to win power and ascend to chieftainship. Their story surpassed many palace power struggles and demonstrated um, why female chieftains were often female bandits in the eyes of the government. When female rulers had such great strengths, how did scholars and officials portray them? Let's look at some examples. First, um, we could take um, a brief look at pictures. Um, pictures of chieftains appear in both the um, illustration of official tribute, Zhi Gong Tu, and the Miao album, Bai Miao Tu. They, um, um, they, there are many uh, very good studies of these pictures, so uh, I will not um, actually go into it. But um, for now, we only need to know that in the Zhi Gong Tu format, we see a female, um, a, a male and a female chieftains of the Luo Luo people, uh, as you can see on the screen in the middle. You see, the female chieftain looks very dignified and her dress very formal, much more so than the male chieftain. And in different versions of the Miao album, on the other hand, the female chieftain under the title of Nu Guan is portrayed to be on an inspection tour, like um, these two pictures on the screen. Or the next one, this one. This is actually my favorite. Oh, look at the horse's big eyes with double eyelids. The horse even has bands. Or uh, this one. Um, the female chieftain is in uh, the hall of uh, the administrative office. Um, um, a very like dif uh, dignified scene. As scholars point out, all the other pictures in the male album portray men and women of different ethnic groups in different living conditions, except for Nu Guan, the female chieftain. She belongs to a separate sub 
category under the main category of the Lolo people. I would say that the way the female chieftain is treated in the male album is an indication of her status as a female ruler, as I try to argue here. So what about uh, literary text? Do they correspond to pictures? Let us look at an example from the Ming Dynasty. In 1537, Madame Qu Qu Shi of the Wu Ding in Yunnan mounted chieftainship after her son died. When the son died, the local government proposed bureaucratization, but the local people strongly supported Madame Qu. So in the end, the central government just had to um, concede. A scholar called Gu Qilun uh, saw Madame Qu when he visited Yunnan. He then wrote a poem called uh, Song of Wu Ding. Bi ji guan xia feng jun guo, bai tou zi shou jin lan nuo. Pi lu guan zi xi pi xue, xiao man xi ma, diao an tuo. Qing ke, uh, qing qie ke, bai qie ke. Cui ji ban e, jiao shuang e. Qian jun hou jun qi ta ge, zheng li za ma, hu po luo. Jing po luo, ying po luo, ping ling bo bei, zhu yan tuo. 夜来也宿空山阿,月落吹炉,渡黑水,客子听之,泪落河。So as the poet um, described, this old Madame Chi was dressed in official attire with purple ribbons, um, very dignified, and a cloak of brocade. She wore a headdress decorated with Buddha heads, also showing her status, and her boots are made of rhino skin. Young girls in waiting were riding on small horses. They wore caps um, made of very fine animal hair, shaped like bird nests, and their hair hung down to reach the eyebrows. Um, you can get a, a rough idea um, of the cap from the, from the picture I show here on the screen. Um, this kind of cap is called Ying Wu Ma, uh, parrot uh, cap. Guards singing marched in front of and behind her. At night, one could hear them making, um, um, I'm sorry, um, in the tents they drank local wine and kept asking for more until their faces turned red. At night, one could hear them making Lu Sheng reed music when they crossed the Blackwater River. While this poem alludes to Li Bai, it also calls attention to the ethnic characteristics that the poet witnessed including clothing, wine, and music. Colors like purple, blue, white, black, gold, and silver make strong impact. All the visual and acoustic elements serve to accentuate the authority of the female chieftain, yet at the same time arouse a sense of alienation and therefore sadness inside the poet. The bamboo song, Zhu Zhi Ci, is a format often used by teen poets to write about local culture. And life in the South is a very common thing. We do find some songs about female chieftains. Let, um, let's look at this example. It says, um, With the maid's helper hold the tail of the gown, she moves to the front of the home, um, uh, morning clouds high up in the sky. The female chieftain, as I saw in pictures, pointing to, um, at the rivers and mountains, she rules full of pride. And in a note appended at the bottom, the poet explains that a female chieftain would wear a brocade gown with sleeves so wide and long that she will need servants to hold them for her. As short as the sun is, it reveals the poet's recognition of the female chieftain as a kind of female ruler by saying that she oversees the land she rules. However, rather than recording a personal encounter with a female chieftain in reality, um, like what the author of Wu Ding Song did, this song seems to be about the impression the poet got from a picture he saw. Perhaps something like this one from a Miao album, as you can see on the screen. 
um, in which we see the female chieftain being supported by servants who hold her gown. And the next example is interest, interesting in um, another way. It says, Blossoms made of silver wires on forehead, bands on temple, temples, and ears decorated with big gold rings. Oh, she really is something. Her skirt trailing on the floor has 36 folds. People vie to take a look at her, just like appreciating a flower. What interests me is both how the poet sees the female chieftain and how he sees himself. The sun is crowded with ethnic markers, such as the blossom-shaped jewelry made of silver, the gold earrings, um, um, and the plated skirt, of course, all corresponding to pictures in a male album. But what strikes me is the concluding phrase. People are vying with each other to look at her. Who are those people? who in the reader's mind are pushing others aside or stepping onto um, um, others' toes just to take a peek. Probably not just her own folk. And isn't the point, uh, isn't the poet looking at himself being among these bystanders? While comparing the female chieftain to a flower is certainly condescending, the poet's self-consciousness of the uh, collective peaking has a comic or even ironic effect because the reader can easily find himself identified with the curious pursuer of exotic beauty. The most elaborate poem about the female chieftain was written by Tian Wen, a famous poet who served as a uh, governor of Guizhou in the early years of the Kangxi reign. The poem, titled Dong Chuan Nu Guan Ge, Son of the Female Chieftain of Dong Chuan, is a fantastic travel between writing and painting, reality and dream, and history and the present. The poem um, is too long for me to recite now, so please uh, go ahead and read it from the screen for yourself. Um, who was this uh, female chieftain? Was she real? Tian Wen did not identify her. But later in the Qianlong reign, when a poem was included in an um, encyclopedia about Yunnan called the Dian Xi, the compiler Shi Fan added an annotation that says, this song is about Madame An, wife of Lu Wan Zhao. Lu Wan Zhao was a Luolo chieftain of Dongchuan region in Yunnan, and his wife, Madame An, was a woman who actually controlled Dongchuan for several decades. This Madame An was usually called the old Madame An, Lao An Shi, because one of her daughters-in-law was also an An, usually referred to as the young Madame An, Xiao An Shi. The old Madame An was never officially appointed the chieftain, but after her husband died in collaboration with the young Madame Anne, her daughter-in-law and niece, she fought with her other daughter-in-law, Madame Lu, for the official seal of chieftain. The war lasted for so many years and resulted in so many deaths in the family that the daughter-in-law, Madame Lu, decided to ask the government to step in and take over the Dongchuan region. In the end, the system of chieftain in Dongchuan was ended, the Gai Tu Gui Liu uh, was complete. When Tian Wen was serving in Guizhou, the strife in Madame An's family was just starting. As the governor of Guizhou, he was also in charge of military affairs of adjacent um, areas. Therefore, um, it's, it's possible that he had a chance to meet old uh, Madame An. In the first three um, couplets, the phrase, I see the female chieftain, appears three times, consolidating the subject-object position of himself and um, the chieftain. The male gaze is the subject, the female is the object, of course, but also the official representing the central government is the subject and the local, the object. The poem builds up an 
ambience of coldness, darkness, and ghastliness, implying the abnormal in so often identified with the woman in power. Perhaps you remember when we mentioned the early Qing play Zhi Kan Ji, in which the world with women in power is described as a world of、uh, pure in training Shi Jie. As a poet, Tian Wen was famous for creating extraordinary imagery to build up the in atmosphere. He uses old temple, dimmed light, chilly wind, and in the setting,、um, and then uses. Um, demon spirits, ghosts, foxes, skeletons,、um, asuras to create the feeling of monstrosity and deadliness. Okay, oops. All right. In the illustration of official tribute and the Miao album, the Nü Guan is respectful and gentle, as you see、um, on the left. A Nü Guan, as a national heroine like Qin Liangyu, can appear as a beautiful woman holding a sword and a book at the same time, as you see on the right. This is so much unlike the Nü Guan Tian Wen met, who only knew weapons but not books. The reader、um, in this poem.、Um, um, Um, contrary to the image of the good female chieftain, the Nü Guan in this poem is drawn into a dream where、um, uh, uh, we, as reader,、uh, can find many opposite elements.、Uh, the Nü Guan is a woman, but with masculine traits, holding a scepter but also wearing earrings, carrying a sharp weapon but also wearing a beautifully embroidered gown. These elements are also present in the bamboo songs, but what constitutes a pleasant atmosphere in the bamboo songs in Tian Wen's arrangement achieve an impression of an ominous shadow? All these point to the author's recognition of the chieftain's power and authority, as well as the threat she posed to the government. The official seal is as big as a bucket. Um, um,、uh, I'm sorry. Where is it? Um, in here. Tong Hou Jue Ying Da Ru Dou. This refers to not only the power struggle in the chieftain's house, but also the poet's own anxiety toward Madame Anne. Consequently, in the last part of the poem, Tian Wen deliberately distances himself again from the female chieftain. He announces his position as the subject, refuses to see Madame Anne as a ruler, and reassures the tributary relationship between the imperial court and the chieftain. He alludes to Du Fu's poem, Xi、uh, Xi Bing Ma, which says that. From all places near and far, countries come to pay tribute. Some country sends white jade rings, some send silver jar. It reminds of the、um, first couplet of the poem. That is, the poet is reimagining an illustration of official tribute, an empire receiving tribute from all countries. I think. This poem is the best work about the double face of the female chieftain, that is the Nü Zhu and the Nü Qiu. To、um, quickly wrap up my talk, I would like to、um, emphasize again my、uh, the point I want to make. First of all, I try to rethink what we consider to be Nü Zhu or female ruler, unlike、um, the empresses, dowagers, and princesses in imperial court. The female chieftains are not yet considered to be female rulers, though they came in succession of chieftainship in、um, their hereditary system. I want to propose that we study the female chieftains of the south as female rulers, though their political power had its limitations. For one thing, if different dynasties continued to tolerate female chieftains, it means imperial China always had.、Um, Flexibility、uh, toward the many differences in the empire. 
Also, we know that studies of Chinese women um, have in recent years challenged the previous understanding of free modern women's life. When female rulers of the South are taken into consideration, it will further um, complicate the problem. To conclude my talk, I will tell a, a story of a female chieftain who went to Beijing in 1431 to pay tribute to Emperor uh, Xuande of the Ming. Her name was Gao Sinong. She came from the Chuxiong region of Yunnan and had stepped into her mother's shoes as chieftain. This um, was her first official visit to the capital. She took off her official attire, put on her ethnic, sorry, put on her ethnic clothing, and she rode on the back of an elephant to pass through the Zhang Yi Gate. One of the spectators painted a painting based on this scene, titling it Tu Fu Gong Xiang Tu, a native woman paying tribute on or of an elephant. And what a spectacle this uh, what a spectacular display of her fariness. Unfortunately, this painting did not um, come down to us. The elephant she wrote was probably not uh, one uh, I'm sorry the elephant she wrote was probably one of her tribute gifts. It's certainly not used as a mount in battle. But just like the clothing she chose to wear, the elephant was part of the show, the performance of the female chieftain's identity as a Lolo woman. As high profile as the spectacle she created was, this female chieftain paying tribute brings to mind maybe not the loyal chieftains such as Qing Liangyu, but the threatening leader such as the Dongchuan Yuguan. Riding on the back of an elephant to go into battle or to pay tribute? That will be the perpetual question. That will be the um, not exactly conclusion of my uh, uh, talk. And a very quick note, um, the picture um, on the left is a painting of an elephant carrying um, tribute gifts being led by an envoy. Um, it's not a female chieftain, unfortunately. And the picture on the right is an uh, artwork by a contemporary Vietnamese artist. It is based on the image of woman Zhao um, in uh, traditional Donghu woodwork printing, as um, we already saw earlier. Okay. Um, now I will uh, stop sharing my screen and let's turn back to um, Professor Saucy. All right, that was a lovely talk. I learned so much. Uh, it's, you know, this is, uh, this is a whole side of, uh, of Chinese local history that you know, one, one just doesn't know about otherwise. Uh, so it was very enlightening and also full of suggestions about the uh, the interpretive moves that people had to make that men had to make when trying to account for the existence of these new to si and new wang and new zhu uh so uh it it really opens many doors and windows uh we have a question coming in from the q a maybe i'll just lead off with that uh this is uh yao hui chiao uh saying, thank you, Professor Hu, for your lecture. I am interested in why so many male authors were interested in writing Lady Xian's life and career to promote their ideologies. She did not belong to the category of Chinese people in their standards. Did these works have wide readership? If they promote a historical female figure of Chinese, Chinese ethnicity by composing literature, how will the effect be different from this kind of literature depicting Lady Xian? So, you know, a question about the, the, uh, the native and the exotic. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, um, first of all, why was Chinese writers so interested in Lady Xian? Um, is, wasn't it because Lady Xian, um, uh, the image was, of Lady Xian was really very useful? in 
I mean, if I um, were um, a scholar at that time, I would use her too. I mean, to promote the idea of um, a, a unified uh, an empire with different uh, uh, ethnic groups of people and also uh, different gender, um, all coming together to support uh, support uh, the central government. So I, I, I would say that that's kind of natural. So um, according to, uh, this is not me, I'm uh, quoting scholars' uh, studies. Uh, so in the Tang Dynasty, Lady Xian, um, well, Lady Xian was useful in different ways, in different times. So in the Tang Dynasty, um, people use her as a symbol um, of, uh, well, a good relationship between the center and the periphery. Um, you know, with the, with the periphery at uh, a kind of um, uh, um, distance from uh, the central government, just good relationship. Okay? Uh, but in the Song dynasty, they would want to uh, re, uh, um, go far into that and make Lady Xian um, kind of um, um, uh, uh, a help in creating a unified empire. And in the Ming, they went even further. They wanted to, to, to use Lady Xian as a symbol of the civilizing project of uh, the Chinese empire. So step by step, Lady Xian became more and more useful. Uh, even when I was a child, when I was a schoolgirl, we studied Lady Xian. And you know what? I never realized that she was not a Chinese. She was not a Han person. I never realized realized that. Just as Qing Liang Yu, I um, learned about Qing Liang Yu when I was a schoolgirl. I never realized Qing Liang Yu was not a Han person. You, so, you, as, so you can see how mm. comprehensive the project um, has become. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the so called civilizing process has this retrospective effect, right? Right. I mean, for that matter, uh, Joan of Arc probably didn't think of herself as a French person, right? Because, you know, France didn't quite exist in the same way that it does today. She might have thought of herself as a, you know, a subject of this king, but not of the nation. Anyway, uh, so the, yeah, your talk gives us a lot to think about. I, I wanted to focus on one uh, little phrase in the description, I believe it was of Lady Zhao where one of the historians writing about her just says, by the by, Bu jia, right? Yeah, uh, right. right, and I want to interrogate that a little bit because that motif of the woman who doesn't marry is, well, it might suggest that these are abnormal women. It might suggest that being a ruler is incompatible with being a woman, right? Because if one jia, then one has a master, according to a patriarchal theory of marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be almost a symptom of the anxiety of the writer, because by saying bu jia, it means, you know, she is wu ho. You know, she's not going to be a hereditary oh, king in a right. line, but she's kind of an strange exception. And then later on, with the new guan, who are mm -hmm. subservient to the regime, they are almost like nuns, it appears, right? They, they're, they're virtuous and they're as if they're married to, to the empire or something. I, it seems to me that this bujia has several different values implicit in it that might correlate with the stances and the, uh, the agendas of the writers who, who use it. And I just was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. I think that's a really good point. Um, bu jia, I think that's the Vietnamese history quoting a Chinese source, but the the origin of the Chinese source is actually unknown. We cannot find the, the original Chinese source anymore. But um, as you said, bu jia does have something to do with how can a woman be a ruler? Um, for example, the Nu Guan, um, I have to say that uh, uh, these female chieftains, they became female chieftains, they became rulers because their husband died. Yeah. Right? Um, right. <laughs> and um, um, so they were like, um, they were married, but they lost their husbands. And that's why right. they became uh, chieftains. That also explains why um, when um, um, uh, scholars uh, found out that in the Miao album, only the Nu Guan is always portrayed as an individual, 
as mm. one person. Right. However, in the other pictures, people appear in couples, right? As right. couples, right. right? But not in Guan. So that is why. Um, and also, um, remember the two Zheng sisters? Mm. At yeah. least the big sister, the Zheng Ce, she was married, according mm. to historical sources. She, oh, uh, she was married, but her husband died because of the Chinese government's oppression. Mm. And that's why she uh, revolted um, in uh, revenge of her husband. So th this is a kind of, um, that's the part of her being Confucian, you know, yeah. uh, conforming to Confucian value for revenge right. your family, like husband. Yeah. But yeah. the Zhao Yu, uh, she was quite different um, mm. in many uh, perspectives. Um, mm. For example, she was not married uh, she had this uh, very distinctive body feature, um, mm. and so on. She right. plundered. Um, uh, plundering um, has nothing to do with the Zheng sisters. I mean, <laughs> maybe they did, but um, mm. in the record, uh, they didn't. Right. They didn't mention it. But for Wu Men Zhao, uh, the sources also mentioned that she plundered. Right? Mm. Um, she had distinctive body feature. She was married, and so on. All pointing to the um, abnormal. Uh, quality right. of her. Right. right. So I yeah. totally agree with you for, for saying that. Um, and actually, the the in um, mm. uh, category is certainly uh, had uh, a lot of uh, to do with this. Right. Right. Yeah. That long passage you quoted from Tianwen with this uh, spooky, you know, temple full of ghosts and so on. You couldn't you couldn't ask for a more comprehensive picture of Yin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was exactly. really an extraordinary piece of writing. We have another question here from uh, Wen Tingji. Uh, it says, thank you for the wonderful talk. Okay, I agree with that part at least. I have a question for the female perspective on these female rulers. Mm -hmm. Most of the materials we saw here are from male literati. Right. I am wondering whether there is any record of how women saw and thought about these female rulers, or if there were any, what could that be? Would it be different from the male perspective? Um, I'm sorry to say that I have not seen um, <laughs> any uh, 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 women writers from um, traditional period to comment on the female chieftains. Uh, I'll have to go back and check on Xian Furen though. Um, I'm not sure so sure about that. For, but for uh, the female chieftains of the Southwest in the Mingqing period, um, I have to say that I uh, I have yet to see more. Um, so I may be the first person <laughs> as a woman to comment on these uh, meeting uh, uh, female chieftains. Um, but um, if uh, a woman writer from the meeting period actually uh, went to comment on um, the female chieftains, would they be very different? Uh, this is very speculative, right? Uh, so I couldn't say I, um, I'm not so sure. What do you think, Juan? I'm not so sure. I, I was going to say, well, they would think, they would certainly think the same way as men did, but, um, wasn't that too, um, <laughs> straightforward? Yeah, kind of it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard to imagine. I mean, the, the wow. sort of, you know, uh, that the, the, the we're used to seeing, uh, these these are women who are pretty much uh, convinced by gender ideology, and uh, so I wouldn't say that maybe, but maybe these um, you know uh, Hao Fang sort of uh, women who were often you know courtesans or something and liked to role play in masculine clothing, maybe they would have seen something attractive in the new jewel. Although you know I, I don't know. Sure, yeah. that's right. I was thinking of uh, thinking about my my writers, my tense writers, who yeah. you know they they were so extraordinary um, in imagining a whole new world with women in disguise ruling the world. So maybe they would think differently. Yeah. But uh, who yeah. know? <laughs> well, anyone who finds one of one of these. Uh, Text by women on the on the new jewel will will win a valuable prize. <laughs> we'll take them out to dinner. <laughs> that would be great. All right, and here comes another question from uh, Yi Zhuo Li. Uh, 
Okay, thanking you for the talk. Uh, it reminds me of the novels in late imperial China where a man travels abroad and encounters the kingdom of women, the Nu Er Guo, for instance, in Xiu Ji and Jinghua Yuan. Jinghua Yuan. Uh -huh. uh, to what extent were those historic Southern women rulers known by the whole country? And how did they influence these imaginary journeys in fictional writings, if they did? Mm -hmm. um, how well uh, were they known to the rest of uh, China? I would say that um, um, contrary to um, our previous understanding, um, actually many uh, scholars, many officials, um, much more, a lot, a lot more than we thought, than we had thought, um, had the experience of going to the Southwest. Mm -hmm. um, in their official career, many of them were even uh, were uh, sent to there to be officials or uh, they were exiled to there. Um, they had missions there or they went there uh, as Mu Liao. Um, so many, so many of them, almost all the, uh, the famous poets that we, we, we know of, they had experience of the Southwest. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Southwest actually um, um, had a lot of uh, impact on them. Mm -hmm. So uh, I do think that the Southwest was not uh, unknown to them. Mm -hmm. Well, as long as the, the, the men knew about the Southwest, the um, female chieftains, I, I would say that in the family, in the Gen Chief families, um, the, the fathers and husbands and brothers would certainly tell stories about their experience in the Southwest, right? So um, I would say that many women um, would know about that too. Um, of course, this brings, brings us back to the previous question, that is then why didn't women write about it? Um, that's something I have to think about and something I would certainly have to explore and read more to see if I was right or wrong that women didn't write about it. Now that, that last question makes me think of another area of uh, Ming and Qing writing, uh, I guess especially Ming, which is uh, writing about uh, Southeast Asia mm -hmm. and where and pirate stories. And there are you know stories of female pirates, right? Of women pirate captains. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now you know these these are people who are never going to become new guan. <laughs> <laughs> right? no. Unless there are some really exceptional circumstances, right? Uh -huh. These are definitely rebel females. Mm -hmm. um, and so, again, I, I don't know this body of writing well, but, uh, you know, I wonder to what extent it is present in people's imaginations and folklore and so on. Yeah. Uh, as, a, uh -huh. as a case that kind of correlates with the case of, of the female rulers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I do think the pun that I used um, is useful in, in, in other ways, right? The Nu Zhu and Nu Qiu, women in power, women with leadership. Um, um, there are so many, um, so many ways to look at them um, as uh, strong women, women mm. um, in power. Um, we just need to find other perspectives than we um, previously did to look at these cases. Yeah. yeah, and I guess, you know, they're fated to always be operating outside the law or in a state of exception. Um, so, you know, the, in the, the places where the system is not working as it's classically supposed to. Right, right. right. Um, I find it so interesting that um, the, the, the local government, as well as the central government, they actually had to uh, sort of like adapt themselves to the, the local chieftain uh, system, right? They had to, whatever they thought about it, this is so strange, this is abnormal, this is un un unconfusion, this is immoral, and so on. They just had to, to um, con concede. Right. Even though scholars always wrote about the immoral behavior of, of the, the female chieftains, they uh, were always complaining, not complaining, they were not complaining, they were actually quite um, um, neutral about it. The fact that the female chieftains, even though their husbands died, they continued to have com male companions yeah. and produce more male offspring. 
offsprings, so yeah. that the line, the family line, can continue. This right. Is, well, this, that's this that's, that's very orthodox in its way. Right. Right. Of course, mm -hmm. that's true. That's true. The family line. It's just. It's not the blood. Right. It's not <laughs> that that's that that was unlike the um, the Chinese society. Right. Yeah. It's not the blood mm -hmm. that counted. Right. It's, it's yeah. imaginary line. Right? right. Right. It's the possibility of continuing. Right. Uh, so we have another question, which uh, sort of answers my prayers here. Um, this is uh, Li Yijuo, uh, who contributes uh, a poem written by a Qing woman named oh, Wu Xiaogu oh, wow. from the 19th century on oh. her journey to the shrine of Madame Xian. So I'm going to do a share the screen, if I yes. may, and we can just share this with our audience because it's really, uh, it's quite extraordinary. Here we are. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so that's great. Yang Hong. Yeah. I'm going to take a snapshot of this. <laughs> I'll send it to you. Don't worry about a snapshot. I'll send it to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I think you just won a dinner. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, to Taipei. You I'll treat you. <laughs> All right. Where, whether you're in Chicago or Taipei, you can, you can knock on our doors and okay. claim your reward. But okay. this is great. But let's look at this poem. Yeah. Um, so, okay, Jingguo Yinxiong is very, you know, classical language for, for this kind of thing, right? right. Okay, um, Xian being um, a sacred mother, mm. um, famous for her like loyalty and chastity and so on. Um, her becoming um, a deity. Um, oh, this is about her um, political wisdom, um, yeah. being able to 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 know who's going to be the the the, the real emperor. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Who, I'm sorry, who was this author? Uh, her name is uh, Wu Xiaogu. And um, her historical period? Uh, 1825 to 1851. Hmm. Okay, 51. Right, because um, the last two phrases implying that she was unsatisfied with her contemporary men, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Oh, mm. right. Mm. Am yeah. I reading right? Right. She's yeah. complaining about mm. um, her contemporaries. Jiang Shuai Wei Kou Chou. Yeah. But the time period uh, can't be very sure about what she's yeah. talking about. Hmm. Yeah, well, this is someone who would have lived, I guess, uh, um, well, just before the, the Taiping Rebellion, I guess. Right, right. right. It's before. It's before. Um, but she, um, where, where was she from? Because she did say something about so she was very aware of the ethnic uh, conflict yeah. behind the story of Xian um, Furen, mm -hmm. right? So she yeah. probably is was talking about some kind of conflict between different um, ethnic groups that she herself yeah. uh, experienced. But I'll have to um, dig into um, this woman's life story yeah. before we can say anything. Yeah. So we we hear from our colleague that uh, the poem is available in the database of Mingqing women's writers. Oh, okay. So, right. so maybe there'll be more information in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Oh, well, how about that? That's great. Where? 
All right, are there more questions? Um, all right. If not, I think, I think we can call it an evening. This has been fascinating. I think all of our audience members have, have learned tremendously from you and been inspired by your adventurous spirit in looking through all kinds of sources to find these exceptional women and making sure that their traces don't disappear. So thank you very much. Thank you, Juan. Yeah. All right, so we're going to close out now. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. We hope you enjoyed tonight's program. The Center for East Asian Studies will be hosting its second Spotlight on Taiwan lecture virtually this Thursday, October 28th at 7 p.m. U.S. Central Time. Join us as we welcome uh, Jia Ling Wu, a professor of sociology from National Taiwan University, who will be examining the regulatory trajectory of access to assisted reproductive technologies in Taiwan. For more information on her talk and to register, please click on the link in the chat box. And as always, if you're interested in receiving information on other events and to learn about the resources that our Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Chicago offers, please be sure to subscribe to the Center's listserv. It's easy to do. Thank you again, all of you, and especially Professor Hu, and I wish everyone a wonderful evening. Thanks very much. Thank you, Juan, and thank you, everyone who participated. Thank you. Indeed. All right. A good evening to everyone.